welcome back, everyone. Uh, my name is Christoph Straub, and I'm the Industry Programming Manager here at TIFF. And it is a great pleasure to welcome you to our second session of the day, uh, this time on filmmakers and audiences on the move, question mark, slash maybe also ex exclamation mark, the cinematic television boom. Um, before we get started, a couple of notes. Uh, I think we there are still some jackets left in the Bell Blue Room, so if you left your jacket there, we thank you very much. Uh, we will take them. We are a charity after all, and we will distribute them. Uh, however, if you want them back, they will be available at the registration desk outside uh, Cinema 4 after this session. Um, also, a big thank you to the Directors Guild of Canada for supporting our industry uh, events here at Canada's Top 10 Film Festival and also at TIFF Studio. And over to the panel now. <laughs> Premium entertainment or high-end television is enjoying an unpre uh, unprecedented boom, not only in North America, but really uh, around the world. Shows such as Boardwalk Empire, The Walking, the Walking Dead, and Game of Thrones draw millions of viewers in the US and Canada alone and have become pop culture phenomena. At the same time, many Canadian producers, writers, and directors are involved in the creation of these popular shows and or are, de are developing their own shows here in Canada or abroad. With audiences and filmmakers seemingly walking away from feature films, uh, we invited a group of renowned filmmakers who have experience in writing, producing, and directing for both feature films and television to explore what, go what goes into the making of premium entertainment for the smaller screens. So without further ado, I'd like to join, like ask you to join me in welcoming our panelists. First of all, we have Adrian Mitchell. Adrian is one of the principal co-owners uh, and executive producer at Back Alley Films Productions here in Toronto. Over her more than 20-year career, Adrian has directed numerous award-winning dramas, including episodes of the critically, critically acclaimed CBC series Drop the Beat and Straight Up, and dramatic uh, and the dramatic crime series, Durham County, which aired on HBO Canada here. And finally, but as well, it aired on global television here in Canada and sold to about 110 international uh, territories around the world. She co-created and executive produced both Durham County and Bomb Girls, which also aired on global television, earning a series of awards, nominations and wins in the process, including a 2010 Directors Guild of Canada award. Adrian, welcome to the panel. Kari Scotland. Kari is an Ottawa-born director, writer, and producer. As director, her extensive credits include the award-winning television series Traders and Queer as Folk, and episodes of the of the Borgia, Borgias, The Killing, Boardwalk Empire, and Vikings. Her 2008 film, 50 Dead Men Walking, played the Toronto International Film Festival and was also part of Canada's Top 10 Film Festival at the time. Her most recent miniseries, Sons of Liberty, you'll see a quick, a quick sneak peek today, will air on History Channel starting on January 25th, later on this month. Welcome, Kari. <laughs> Clement Virgo's television credits as director include The Wire, The L Word, The Listener, and Copper. Several of his films have played uh, at the Toronto International Film Festival, including his acclaimed de debut feature, Rude, which was also a selection at Cannes. Lie With Me played as TIFF as well, and Poor Boy's Game. Of course, his latest project as co-writer and director is a CBC Bet miniseries adaptation of Lawrence Hill's best-selling novel, The Book of Negroes. Um, in case you missed it, it premiered last night at on CBC, and it will be screening the fi final or the other five episodes will be screening on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Uh, all throughout January and early February. So go watch them, <laughs> and welcome uh, Clement. And last but certainly not least, uh, our mo moderator, Marguerite P Pickett, is Vice President, Outreach and Strategic Initiatives for the Canadian Media Production Association. Previously, she was Super Channel's Head of Creative Development and Vice President of Development at production and Production for Odeon Films, where she executive produced St. Ralph, Fubar, and Way Downtown. Marguerite was also Principal of Mega Megalomedia Incorporated, where she was uh, executive story consultant for the TV series Bomb Girls and story editor for the feature films One Week, Still Mine, and My Awkward Sexual Adventure. From 2006 to 2007, 
Oh, sorry. And uh, from 2006 to 2007, she programmed the Canadian feature film selection for TIFF as well. So she's been a friend of TIFF for a long time. In other words, she's also a perfect fit really to moderate this session. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Marguerite. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Is this on? OK, great. Um, so as, as uh, Christoph mentioned, um, directors are progressively more migrating between um, television and cinema, and television is becoming progressively more cinematic in some instances. So I just wanted to start off by clarifying terms. And the kind of television that we're going to be talking about today is often called premium entertainment, um, and it's often characterized by, you know, it's being serialized or uh, suitable for binge watching, that kind of thing. So I just wanted to kind of clarify terms at the very beginning. Um, so obviously we're talking about shows like Durham County, The Wire, Boardwalk Empire, shows that have been directed by um, these panelists. Um, so we're going to look at uh, the creative opportunities that can be found in the cross-pollinization between uh, the two formats. I hate that word, it's so antiseptic, but there you go. Um, and how storyte storytelling and the director's vision kind of fare in the translation and how you can thrive creatively with a foot in both camps. So one of the things that I think is really interesting as we have this conversation is that it is often said that cinema is a director's medium and that uh, television is a writer's medium. And so genetically, the two media are, are very different. And so I wanted to look at that in a couple of different ways. And I'm going to start with you, Adrian. So you, in your role as a series creator, creative bomb girls, play Durham, so on. Um, you are intimately involved in the writing process of these television series um, throughout every script throughout production, yet at the same time you're also a series director and you're directing the first episodes, thereby setting the directorial vision for the series. So because of that, because of your unique placement in these series, do you feel that your television in specific is slightly less uh, writer dominated and a bit more of a director's medium? How do you feel the balance is situated? Okay, well, hello? Can you hear me? I didn't have that kind of booming feel, which made me, which validates me, so I don't feel validated right now. Anyways, okay, I'll always start with a joke. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that right? <laughs> I, have to, I have to remember that. Um, well, wow, what a fabulous question. Uh, well, look, you know, uh, in terms of, let, let's talk about the projects. It, I mean, uh, it is a collaboration. Uh, with Durham County, uh, Janice, myself, and Lori co-created Durham County. Uh, Lori was the writer uh, of the series, and uh, that was uh, a series that I was also getting my first sort of, the first season, my first break as a director. I had the very talented Holly Dale working with us to do the first four episodes. It was a six, six, the first season was six, uh, one hours. Uh, Holly did the first four, I did the last two, and, and the subsequent, subsequent seasons, I, I sort of started them off uh, and did two or three episodes each. Uh, but my role as a director on those shows is very much in collaboration with the writer. I think that what's different by having a strong or, uh, you know, a strong directorial vision on board uh, is that I think you get more of a unified vision in, in, in the series. I think there is uh, an opportunity for the writer to uh, work with the director to agree on what the visual palette is. I, I, you know, for Durham County, I walked around with photographs, you know, with, shot every kind of type of hydro tower scenario possible. Uh, I, I worked with color palettes. I, cha I, know, I, I presented various different tones and grays I wanted you know, I wanted a certain kind of a scenario where where everything was a bit monochromatic and certain colors were popping up. So I was able to bring that uh, at the, the very early stages to even the presentations to the the network before they even green light the show. So and and Lori would be, you know, emailing me paintings and things like that. And and so it 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 was a true collaboration, but I think that because I had a unified vision with Lori for the entire season, and it was this, this great opportunity when you do a six, you know, six one hours, w where you can actually execute and see that vision through to the end without having to 
bring many other people on board and, and having that vision diffused, you're really able to do that. So I think that that's what's different about it. I don't think it's necessarily that the director has, you know, uh, you know, um, I don't know what you, how you put it. I, I, I think what's, what it is is that you've got a, um, a stronger uh, sense of a cinematic vision if you have a director working with you at the very, very, very beginning. Whereas instead of being just like a hired gun coming in. Okay, so that, that segues into what I wanted to ask Clement and Carrie, which is, you know, going back to that idea of, of cinema as director's medium, um, uh, television as a writer's medium, I wanted to talk to you guys both about um, how you feel your role shift. So when you're directing a feature film, how you work as a director versus when you step into, or how you, how you, just, how you, how you, how you feel the balance of your role on the team on a feature film versus on a television series that you're stepping into, like a Borges or a Boardwalk Empire. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I, I sort of see myself in, in two ways. I, I sort of see myself as a kind of hard hat director and a filmmaker. And the, and the hard hat director knows how to walk into a room and knows that he has to be out of the room in like two hours and he has to shoot f four pages, right? So that's a hard hat director's craft skill. And then, and then the filmmaker's side of me is then the creator, which is a, a writer, a, a writer, a director. And for me, that's a different, a different skill altogether, which is you're creating a world. You're creating a vision for the piece. So, so if I'm working for, um, you know, if I'm a hired gun and, you know, I, you know, um, it, it's a cop show or something or whatever it is. And I know, okay, I got to shoot five pages in the, in the, the boardroom and in, in the jail cell in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I got to go to the guy's apartment and it's all in the same location. It's a different, it's a different kind of skills. And, and oftentimes with the television, you, you know, you're, um, you're, you're uh, photographed and people talking oftentimes, which is, you know, oftentimes it's, you know, the, the sets don't even matter sometimes. It's just the dialogue that matters, you know, and, and, and your job is to, for, you know, certain shows, they want to just keep it alive. You know, they just want the balls to be up in the air, like keep it kind of like, don't bore me visually. So you learn a skill of, okay, you move there, you move over there and you keep talking and you keep talking and you, you learn that skill as a director just to keep it, you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, so you, so you learn that skill, a pen, eat an apple. right? You know, get up, you walk in, and you know, and you get into kind of like, and then if you're a director, that's you know, you're in season three, and you're coming in to do episode five, and the actors hate each other, and you don't know the politics of the show, and you're the new guy, and you're like enthusiastic, and they're like. <laughs> Oh, okay. Let's. Who's this dude? Like, let's. You know, and they test you right away. Like, give you know, they look at you sideways. Like, okay. And then you finally have to win them over. And I see. I sort of see. You know, part of my job as a, a hard at director is that there's usually a bunch of chairs. You know, you have the, the what you call like a video village, right? And then you have the director's chair, and then you have like usually four or five chairs of producers behind you. And I, and and I sort of see myself. My job that first day is to try like clear out all those chairs, which is like, I know what I'm doing, it's good. And so by, the, by like, you know, two hours later, they're in their offices, you know, doing their emails or whatever. So they know that they can relax. So it's a very, very different skill, at least, you know, at least for me. Uh, that was really eloquent. That was really good. <laughs> Maybe laugh too, because it's quite true. Um, you know, Funny enough, I think I get really annoying because um, I tend, I, I keep bringing this cinematic thing with me wherever I go. So um, I'm, I find I'm always at conflict with that got to be out of here in two hours mentality and what can we do to make this sing? Um, so when I'm in a, in a situation, which fortunately I haven't been in lately because um, I think uh, besides sort of frustrating me a little bit, I started gravitating toward, and maybe people saw it in the work, and maybe the world changed, because I think the big thing is that the world changed. And um, more and more people, or more and more um, productions, actually want the cinematic side. And um, they're starting to see the, the um, not only the, the I want to say the, the fallout from it as being super positive, they're actually now needing it. So the, the 
sort of the being anointed as a filmmaker style director became a signature that helped me, you know, I mean, eclipse the fact that we were going to talk about this later, but I'm a female. And did you notice? <laughs> and I direct a lot of very um, high octane uh, masculine shows. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know how I, I just got lucky. But I kept focusing on the creative and the creative and the creative. And I, I, um, I think somehow that helped me to just cut myself a little bit out of the pack. And people kind of go, well, she's kind of interesting. I'm sure there was some affirmative action in there sometimes too. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I think the creative, uh, in amongst all that juggling of the, the different balls and trying to you know, clear the decks as well as uh, you know, keep the, the actors actually in the room because that can be sometimes just its own heartache um, when people have to go off and do various things and you're standing there trying to get it in under the clock. Um, but is to turn in dailies that are somehow genuinely cinematic. And I, I, I only once had, so, and I, I honestly didn't understand the, the, it was intended as a criticism. I said, oh my God, Kari, this looks too much like a feature. And I, I, you know, is that a bad thing? And that was like four years ago, maybe. And since then, that has not only not been a bad, it was a bad thing at that time. Or not a bad thing, but just the worlds were two different places. So if you brought your cinematic experience to one place, it really wasn't, um, it wasn't really desired in the TV space. But now it's not only desired, it's required. So you do have to, you know, hone your skills and make sure that you're bringing that to the table or else or else you're just you know one of the pack and your days are numbered i think okay all right um so i so thanks for that and i want to talk a little bit about the writing side of things because um all of you are also involved in the writing side of things i know uh clement and carrie have writing credits on feature length projects uh you also have a writing credit on book of negroes and congratulations again that premiere was fabulous last night i loved it um uh adrian you're a you know creator of television series and i know a non-writing showrunner and so i want to talk a little bit about the um the development process uh, for you guys. And I'm gonna start with you, Adrian. When you're collaborating with writers, do you feel that, and I know you're developing um, a feature film now and you have in the past, is your collaboration with the writer different when you're working with a writer on a feature film versus when you're working with a showrunner on a series for you? Um, I think that, uh, I think that uh, it really depends on the broadcaster and it depends on the project. I've had the I had the amazing opportunity to develop a, um, a really unique non-linear crime series uh, with a new voice, Jane Maggs from Newfoundland with the CBC. They're doing a lot of, you know, really interesting, developing a lot of very interesting material. Um, you know, they even say things like we're really interested in working with uh, material that is like premium cable. So in that scenario where again, it's like a six to eight episode series where you could map the entire series out and get into the depth of the characters and, and work on the sort of, you know, what, what the cinematic approach is going to be um, and not have that kind of uh, restraint of the procedural, of the rules of the procedural, um, of the forced, you know, conclusion that happens at, at the end of every pr procedural. Uh, to me, it's like a long feature. Working on that kind of a series and working on Durham County was like working on a long, fe long, a long feature again because you've got, as you know, sometimes we coin uh, working on those kinds of six one-hour episodes that aren't that are very character-driven. We, we we oh, can you hear me better now? Do you feel uh, validated? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> Uh, we call them like novelizations, you know, so, so dramatic novelizations. And so I don't uh, feel it, it, it's much different in, in, in that respect. But, you know, working on shows that have more of an, uh, a, a, you know, a procedural episodic um, bent, it's totally different because it's almost like math sometimes. I feel like it's more like math a little bit. You lose a bit of that creative outside the box thinking that sort of let's just go, let's go, go someplace where we don't know, you know, how it's going to end. And let's go to the place of no return. And maybe that's a more interesting journey than the place of I know where I'm going to return. 
So I guess, you know, so certain broadcasters want that kind of procedural element and others are experimenting more now. And I think some of the ones that are, you know, also are recognizing, like for example, Shaw, Broadchurch, the UK version did very, very well for them in terms of the six one hours. And they're, you know, they're looking, they're also very open to looking for those kinds of things in terms of how, what I've been pitching to them as well, so. Okay, great. That, does that answer the question? It does. Okay, thank does you. That answer you said the it, kind of, it depends on the broadcast, okay. right? And, and and that makes a ton of sense. Okay. Because um, yeah, the yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, so for uh, Clement and Carrie on the same on the same topic, I wanted to find out like when you are in a development process for uh, television um, versus feature film, do you have the same uh, creative considerations with regard to character and story, or do the considerations change at all, or do the is it not so much the considerations that change in terms of the big elements of, of good writing, but the execution of, of those considerations? How do you feel that's working for you now? Ooh, you want to take a swipe at that one first? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay, if I can remember all that. Um. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can I study for a second? Well, you know what, first of all, I think it really depends on the team. So, um, you know, when you're working with certain teams that are incredibly strong in certain areas, um, uh, you're, you, certain parts of you aren't as required, you know, so you, you don't need to, to focus on that. Um, and in fact, you might be, um, uh, you know, they're better at it than you are, for example. Um, or they're so deeply inside the the thing um, that uh, you're drawing on that. So, I guess I, the first thing I'd say is you evaluate the situation and you see where you you want to put your skill set and your focus um, is the obvious answer there. But you know, uh, I think having said that, no matter what, part of I I feel like part of what we do is open doors to other ways of thinking about something. So. If someone ha comes to me and it's partially developed um, and they're in a box, and this happens all the time, features uh, particularly, frankly, um, so then I do a pass on the script, I think about it differently, I come at it sideways, whatever it is, I realize that it, I need to do a reshuffle on the deck and um, and sort out some of the, the issues that are clearly there. Um, that's a case where I'm taking the whole thing and just saying, all right, uh, we're going to start from scratch, and and my vision goes right through the writing, um, into the visuals and everything. And the nice thing about being a writer director is that you write to what you see. So um, um, there, there's not really an interpretation in there. When I'm working for a really strong, you know, working with Neil Jordan, for example, which was, I mean, fantastic. Um, he's a incredibly strong writer and a very strong visual. Uh, director. So, you know, uh, what do you do? You walk in and just, you know, feel, <laughs> yikes, um, how do I measure up? Uh, and he was fantastic because basically he just said, go do your magic. That was it. And uh, let me do my my thing as a, as a um, director and as a, um, uh, you know, taking his words and, and, and putting them into the, into the space of, of, you know, being filmed. Um, but I also collaborate with the actors too. So in part of that development process, as the different people come on, on side, some actors are really strong um, with their sense of cinema, um, their sense of writing. Um, and I always trust them when it comes to character because um, rarely are they wrong. There are some times when they're offside. But when they come, when an actor comes to you with, a, with you know, some insight into the character that they've been focusing on, I think it's not only worth listening to, usually it's, it opens a whole bunch of other doors for me where I think, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. Let's run down that road. So I think, you know, to answer the 17 questions that were in that one question, it is um, like a, you, you evaluate the situation, then it morphs and changes. So there's no, there's no static um, process. And even when you're in the process, it's not static. So you can be in the middle of shooting and this happens to me all the time. And I'm sure it happened to you on Boca Negras where you suddenly you have either production issues or, or acting issues, performance issues or money issue, whatever comes up. And you now suddenly have to turn torque on your heel and go, all right, how do we solve this creatively? And you do kind of jump back into development mode in a way, but you're, you're, you know, 
you're, you're full steam. So I don't know that we ever lose that sort of development process, even as we we're going. That was a little tangential, but that's. Well, well, uh, you know, again, as you know, if if I have on my hard hat director hat and and, and my filmmaker hat, when I'm hired, oftentimes, you know, I try to. You know, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out, well, what kind of director do they need from me? When I go on a set and I meet actors for the first time and 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 I don't know them, it's like, okay, what do they need from me? You know, I, I'm i trying to figure out how to adjust to them. Some actors, you know, they want to talk, in, you know, very closely and very intimately. And some just like, you say half a word and they're just like, okay, I, I got it. And so when I'm working with a, a showrunner, a writer, it's, it's like, okay, what do you need from me? Some want to you there and some like you know what leave me alone I, I don't want you know this is your script go do it and so you figure it so you so as a director for hire you're trying to balance for me anyway trying to balance what is it that they need and then as a filmmaker a writer a director I'm intimate oftentimes I have to say you know if I'm working on a script and I'm with you know someone might say well I don't get it like what is it why does she want to do that like why does she want to go back to Africa I'm like well you know, trust me, I might sh I'll show that to the camera. You know what I mean? So oftentimes, as a writer, director, you're oftentimes putting stuff in the script just to make sure people who are not visually attuned to certain things are, you know, aware. And so, you know, for me, I'm, you know, I, I see it. And sometimes it's hard to sometimes translate, I get why I'm doing something, you know? And sometimes you have to put it on a page to say, Oh, put it in someone's mouth, and the easiest way to do it is through dialogue. You know, right? So oftentimes, you 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 know, you add dialogue simply because people need to understand. And so I have to just add to that because how many times are you in the edit room where, you know, and sometimes when I direct, I, you know, you know, there's a piece of dialogue that you know, the writer, even my colleague, is wanting, and you just put a little bit of a pause just before they say the line, <laughs> a, and a little bit of a pause a after they action. say the line. And you take it out, and they've already, as you say, you can. It, it sometimes speaks much, la much, much more powerfully without that 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 dialogue. So it's a, such a fascinating process. And I think that a lot of the, the the writers I've worked with too have just during the editing process have have just learned so much about how it's you know not just about the printed word; it's about what the actor's giving and and how they can give a lot more than what that printed word is there is there. And that also goes for the the broadcast executives who want everything all spelled out sometimes, and then they can see well, you know, it's overstated. You know, yeah. Exactly. And yeah. go ahead, Kurt. No, I was going to say I'm noticing a change, and it's probably a lot due to um, you know Durham County, for example, where you were show running the same time, that the value, um, it, it's taking a while, but with the success of shows like, I mean, the obvious ones, True Detective and, and um, um, you know, name, name the five top that we all refer to, uh, where the visual had a very strong influence in what we're talking about, the, uh, that words sometimes are dull. Um, or they're, they're just too many words, as too many notes, as you know, Emma Day said. So, um, uh, but they're starting to see the success of that, but you, it takes the fine hand and someone with the eye to... to so the, the collaboration between the two is making so much more sense now than it did before. It seemed like overkill. And I, funny enough, I was at a, a, one of these things and, uh, with a couple of showrunners, um, and um, they said, well, you know, we really don't... don't um, I, I don't really understand that. And I was recently working with someone who said, I, I, I'm just visually impaired. I just don't, you know, get it. And so their compensation was too many words. And, you know, and and couldn't kind of get past that because they, so those kinds of showrunners would be incredibly enhanced. Their work would be incredibly enhanced. And, and maybe that will start to happen more and more where um, they, it, it, I think it is happening. I'm not saying it will. It is happening. And it is happening because the filmmaker is now becoming, uh, in whatever definition that is, and it can be a collaboration of three people. It can be one person. It can be one person and three people coming on board who are going to uh, actualize that, you know, three different directors and stuff. But it's also how, okay, the whole also, okay, now you're getting what you want. We're talking to each other now. I okay. asked nicely. <laughs> okay. So the other thing that, as you talk about that, Carrie, is the, I don't know how you, if you've been told by your showrunners or the execs that 
you know, people want to hear the, the voices. They don't like silences when they're watching television. And so I'm often, I'm, I'm wondering the experience of, rece- you know, watching. How is that changing now? I mean, we've got, we've got, of course, network television. We've got premium television. Like a, and it's really interesting when you have some certain shows I'm watching now, I'm thinking, I really want to watch this show without commercials on HBO. It, it, it's not working as well with the commercial, so you watch it online. Because there's so many silences, and it's, it's ponderous, it's reflective, and it's, it brings you in in a different way. So that is such a fast, to me... Because that's what I, I'm more excited about shows that make me work a little harder, that don't you know, fill, with, fill it with dialogue just for the sake of dialogue. And have, there's visuals, there's things that are not being said, things are hanging in the air. I ha- and, and so it's just an interesting discussion about, about that and if, if the more mainstream networks are opening up to that kind of viewing experience. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, even when I get a three page scene or something, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out, okay, how do I. How do I, if I didn't have any dialogue in this scene, how do I translate the scene visually? So oftentimes, you know, that's where I come, you know, that's what I, I pro, that, that's my approach to, to like any scene. How do I, tra- what is going on and how do I translate it visually, right? And so that's my process. And, and if I could strip, and, and, and if I could like strip away a dialogue, I will, because I mean, for me, it's about it's about cinema. It's about the visuals, right? Earlier, you asked. I mean, some, about about being a hired director. Some people just don't trust visuals. They just don't trust it at all. You know. Well, and isn't that a lot dependent upon the quality of the actor? Because we, as we talk about all this dialogue, I'm thinking that dialogue is nothing but a hindrance to really good actors because good actors can show so much through behavior. Because it's all about behavior. I mean, for me, it's always like, how do you reveal character through behavior? You know, how does, what is the body language? What's the space between people? How, how does, you know, what does that person, how do they react? So you're constantly trying to figure out where's your camera? How do they behave? What is the dialogue? Because I think we see more than we hear. I really believe that. I, I, I think that's why cinema, I think, works because I think we we're always evaluating each other not by what we're saying, by how we're behaving, you know. And and I think the human brain is, I think, is very equipped at picking up little nuances about behavior and translate it into meaning. And so I think oftentimes, you, you know, as a director for hire or something, you 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 know, you'll you'll have a scene and it's just you think, well, the scene is not about anything because it's just about people talking. It's about it's about trying to move the plot forward through dialogue. And as a filmmaker, I don't, you know, for me, I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in how do I translate it visually um, to the end. I just saw a great film called Ida. I don't know if you've seen this film. Yeah, yeah. This, this I mean, it just this is like a, a lesson in film school, this film, because it's so tight and economical and visual and behavior. You know, um, and po- and just visual poetry, and you're always trying to figure out how do I create poetry, right? Yeah, right. Like, 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 how do you create visual poetry as a filmmaker? And that's a, you know, some people are good at it. You know, um, Peter Ware is excellent at it. You know. So what Camping we're talking about, which is, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is one of your coming up questions, is that cinema is being because I think in what we're talking about as the as the um, the sort of centerpiece of, of this discussion is how is you know cinema being brought to television and what is the big change coming? And you know I, I've been trying to I'm sure we all have everyone's trying to keep their finger on the pulse of what is the change. And you know my sense of it is that the change is huge and it's coming fast. It's coming like a freight train. And we're going to see. I had some very interesting discussions like literally within the last 24 hours with some very high level people about this very subject because I wanted to be kind of prepared today. And one of the things that that came up, which I think is um, uh, very encouraging for everybody in this room, how many writers are here, by the way? And how many writers, uh, how many directors? An even split. split. Uh, And how many writer directors? (laughs) Okay, and how many producers? Oh, okay, great. We need more producers. (laughs) 
Um, so, so, um, uh, in terms of filmmakers and what, so they were, this particular person was talking about how networks right now, because they're all kind of scrambling and advertising dollars are getting softer and softer and it's not clear where advertising dollars are going to land um, because they're not just flocking to digital. So that's, so it's not like one paradigm is just going to shift over to digital and we'll have the same thing there. So in other words, that's maybe, because the only reason we have a five-act structure and everything else is to play the commercials. So if you do an HBO-style thing where it's now one little hours and, or and Netflix, um, okay, it's, a, it's just a different thing, right? And we're going to tell our stories differently. Now, at the same time, everyone's trying to brand. So, so they're all scrambling for position. Netflix is a nanosecond away from having a, a boatload of people right behind them offering up the exact same stuff. Um, and uh, already, you know, even CBS is now OTT. So, so they're going to get, they're getting in the game. Showtime um, and HBO and everybody's getting in the game. So how do you differentiate and how do you, right? And that's where the cinema comes in and that's where we come in. Yeah. And so um, I, I'd like to show Clement's clip now uh, because I want to go to, I want to uh, go back and talk about uh, your process on, on Book of Negroes um, uh, just briefly. So can we show Clement's clip? They will hold you overnight at Bounce Island. Tomorrow they will take you to a big canoe. You are one of the lucky ones. Lucky? Others have been dying slowly, waiting for that boat to fill up. But you won't have to wait. Soon we'll be parted. Beware of your beauty amongst these strangers. I won't go. You will go, you will die. I will return back home. I have taken many people to the sea, but not once have I seen a man return. I sleep by day and walk by night until I see my village again. Aminata Giallo.
So, uh, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit. I mean, obviously that clip beautifully il illustrates the point. I mean, it was a three minute clip and there's like one page of dialogue, something like that, if that, um, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about your process on Book of Negroes. When you're writing a movie, there are no parameters really other than those that you you create for yourself. But on Book of Negroes, obviously, you've got to fit the story into hour-long chunks and all of that. And so I wanted to talk to, you, talk to you a little bit about the writing process on Book of Negroes and how for you that was different from feature film or, or what your process was and how you found working within somewhat foreign parameters. Uh, for me, it, it wasn't different. It was the same, the same process. Um, and I think the process for me, it, 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 it's odd because I really, it might sound odd, but I don't really consider myself a writer, even though I've written all my movies, you know, for the most part, and um, or, or, or I've co-written them. And with the Book of Negroes, I wrote five of the episodes and Larry wrote one of the episodes. But I still find it hard to call myself a writer because basically what I do is that I don't want to write. I really don't. But um, I sit, you know, I have a chair and I sit down and, uh, you know, and then I leave and go watch Oprah a little bit and come back. <laughs> right. And then and then I, you know, and then I start to um, just visualize things. You know, I just start to visualize, you know, feet. Heat. Um, she's been pulled. And, you know, this brand, you know, so I, I write these. I just write what I see. And I write what I and I and I don't really love dialogue, so I you know I sometimes and when I write I just start I don't even, I just start just having people just talk to each other just start to talk, and then I go back and strip it away. So what I do as a writer is I write it fully out, and usually the first draft is really really big, and then I go back and I just and I start taking it out, taking it out, and I and I keep like combing and combing over like you know. Uh, until I feel like there isn't a, um, uh, a line or, or a moment that is not a, a part of it, and I have my own rules as a writer. You know, I, you know, like I want as much white space on the page as possible. You know, I, and so that's my goal. M you know, my goal is how do I get you to turn the page? How do I intrigue you and get you to turn the page and, and not be bored? And that's and and if I can't figure out how to do that, I, I you know, I get really frustrated. And so it's not about dialogue for me. It's about, you know, and I think it's also a process of immersing myself in the material. Because I think once I immerse myself visually in the material, I become a better director. So let me ask you, because that all, I mean, that all makes a lot of sense as part of an organic process. But then you got to deal with commercials. Mm -hmm. And you got to deal with cliffhangers. And you've got to deal with episode endings and all of that. Was that something that you were... I never thought of that. <laughs> I really, I like literally... Uh, but 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 what was great um, was that CBC was great at that. Oh. CBC was great at that. No, they were. I mean, they're they're really good at, you know, this is where you need to end it. This is where you need, you know, you gotta, you, you should. This is where the 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 hook should be, the cliffhanger. And I relied on 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 the, on the, the CBC for that because that's not my skill, really. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, could we show Adrian's clip next? Yes. Yeah. Ellie, Dan, George, we should do two in that one clip. What's the issue? It's Down's view, sir. They say it's urgent. The Air Force calling here? Harold Akins. Good Lord. <laughs> People, we need to evacuate. Move. Get our guests to the safe station. No, sir. This is real. Fly four to tunnel one. Fly five to tunnel two. Carol, get the girls into the tunnels. What's going on? There's an unknown plane in the restricted fly zone headed straight for the plant. The train. They've been loading boxcars all week. Good Lord. There's a thousand tons of explosives on it. Mr. Akins, are you coming? Soon. I need to get that train away from the city. Downstairs! Pachinski! Help me shut this down!
spotters all over the city. You must have saw a German aircraft. Why, the Japs? Who knows what's coming at us? Hey, there's got U-boats in the St. Lawrence. They sunk a ferry off the coast of Labrador, clearing the way for the goddamn Luftwaffe. Don't spook yourself. It's crazy talk. Crazy? Was Pearl Harbor crazy? Last well, you're taking up oxygen. Shake a leg and help me here. Come on. Show any weakness, they're gonna rip you to shreds. They're gonna eat you alive. You get yourself a mantra. I am, I am destruction. I will not be destroyed. And and harness that power. You let that electricity run right fucking through you, and you're you're a man god, a man god. Yeah. I'm destruction. I'm a man god. That's me, Dad. Don't you know you are? You're a puny little fuck. You let Mike Sweeney push you around? Well, what am I supposed to do? Sucker a cop? Be a fucking man. There she is. She looks like her sister, huh? Right. To water, air, fire, and earth. She's gone. She was such a wonderful person. She said you were wonderful too, you know? She said your stories reminded her of Raymond Carver's. <laughs> she called us the two rays. Hey. Hey. We're the two rays now, kid. Don't you forget it, okay? Like father, like son. Let's think about her now. Ow, Mr. Prager! Ow! 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ow! I'm sorry, I got, uh, I got carried away. heard that from you. I should sue them. Um, uh, so one of the things that we've been talking about this whole time is cinematic feel, but cinematic is inherently, it's, it's a vague term, right? Uh, and so I wanted to, to, to talk to you about that, Adrian, and because it's not just about the visuals, right? It's, it's about other things as well. And so I just wanted to get a sense when you're talking about you want a cinematic yeah. tone, you want a cinematic feel, what does that mean to you? And I think it'll mean different things to different people. But for me, in terms of how I, what excites me as a filmmaker and a director um, is uh, geography, landscape, where the character is, like, and, and showing the context of where the character is. I love playing scenes out in long shots where people are just, you know, small, uh, you know, very small in relationship to the, the scene and the architecture because I find also that that is is like, that's telling me something about their isolation, where they are, how the environment is impacting them, how isolated they are from their environment. All of that's very fascinating to me. It's the thing of the backs of heads, the backs of people, like the, you know, when the, they're all just um, holding hands there and they're all in black. It's the production design. They all have the same kind of black clothing and it almost looks like there's a sort of, uh, uh, it, it, it's just so almost like graphic novelish the way the way that that's coming across. So it's production, all those elements that are not the constant close up on the face, you know, and the medium shot, and it's it's the in, 
we're, it's not service to the dialogue all the time. It's cinema, cinema is not always service to the dialogue. It's, it's um, um, going, it, it's, you know, being, uh, staying on, on somebody else's expression as the other character is talking for much longer than you feel comfortable with. Because there's something actually a little bit more interesting about how that person's listening to somebody than actually that person who's talking. So it's those kinds of, to me, that's what cinema is, is anything you can do that creates the emotional, psychological state uh, in a way that's not necessarily in service to the dialogue, but that gives you another place to go psychologically and emotionally. So let me ask you about, so that's very clear and, and, and good, and so thank you for that. How do you, when you're, when you're beginning to uh, put a show together, um, you know, you've got that cinematic vision, you've put together a lookbook, let's say, yeah. for your pitch. Yep. How do you assemble your team in such a way? How do you create the conditions as a showrunner creator that allow you to bring everybody in the team on board so that everybody, you mentioned production design, it's production design, it's acting, it's everything. How, how do you bring that team together? Well, you know, the thing is, first of all, you need, first of all, well, uh, just, uh, just on a very basic level, I do a lookbook uh, where I take, um, I've either taken photographs, I've um, found found images from online, and I, I have a very elaborate lookbook that I share, and these images will have, be broken down into tone, color, mo you know, um, and now that there, I also have a kind of a movement reel where there's I I choose from different movies I've seen or documentaries or anything, just to sort of come up with a pattern of how what I'm thinking about for for the the the, the, the approach to the series, and um, so I use the lookbook uh, and that, and we first it's the DOP you know the, the DOP and we talk about it we we talk about how can we execute it in the time budget and all that kind of stuff and he and he or she will um, uh, you know find ways of uh, building on it which I love because I, I I don't want to just I, I want someone to build on my ideas and 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 it's a great collaboration so that that happens and then once you get your DOP maybe he'll edit a few things and, and you'll add and enhance and then you bring that to the that is the Bible. That's the visual Bible. You're bringing that to the uh, production designer, the costume designers. Uh, I've even shown them to the actors. And I've, I've, you know, I remember with in in season two of Durham County, when well, Mich Michelle Forbes uh, saw uh, season one, she was really hooked. But when I showed her the lookbook for season two, she said it really helped her get into a kind of preparation for her role. So it's, it's that kind of thing. And also it's really good to show that your network executive so they can start to understand what you're trying to do because what I'm finding, and I don't know what you're, you guys are finding, you know, is that you know, it's so fascinating that you know, it's on the page, you have the lookbook, and still the network is interpreting something else when they see it in the edit room. You know? So anyways, that I think mitigates a little bit if you've got those visuals. And it's, I have to stress that if you don't have a network executive, this is for TV, who understands what you're doing, it is a challenge. And with Durham County, uh, oh my God, we had Michelle Marion and Shelly Erickson, uh, Shelly, sure, Shelly Gillen and eventually Erica Benson. And they were very, they, it was basically, you guys aren't pushing it far enough. Push, push, go outside the box more. That's the kind of, you know, and that, if without a network, network executive, spurring you on like that you're not going to get that kind of thing and with bomb girls it wasn't cable it was is on global um but we also were we had a very strong visual style for that and and they were on board with it as well and, and because of all the lookbook and i've but i've had other experiences where they should be nameless where it's just wow you uh, i showed you the lookbook showed you the thing and uh you're in the edit room and you want something totally different so that's that's the success of a show is to have that unity of vision with everyone yep yep and clarity on that from the beginning um can we show carrie's clip please <clears throat> You're not talking about defending your rights as Englishmen. You're talking about a new country. All the colonies united. A new nation.
Any man found in violation of His Majesty's laws will be dealt with without mercy. I'll be the first. So there's been an incident in the colony. I'll be number two. A group of rebels causing mischief and mayhem in the streets. Oh, these are our streets! Gentlemen, you will henceforth be known as the Minutemen. These colonists are committing treason. They are thugs and outlaws. The sons of tyranny. They should be beaten into submission. Send in the troops. I found you. We need more guns. You have the influence. I have the money. This has gone too far. It has to end now. So this is where greatness resides. Ooh. Show them what we're made of. I just love that a Canadian is doing the American Revolution. It feels almost as satisfying as the fact that we burned the White House, right? <laughs> it's like, it's very pleasing to me. Um, so, so I wanted to ask you. A certain irony to be had. Sorry, what? A certain irony to be had. There is. Um, I, I was, I was going to ask you a different question, but I was just, you know, a question for me was provoked by what Clement had to say about, you know, when you were working on Book of Negroes, you didn't worry so much about, you know, having your cliffhangers, dealing with commercials, those kinds of uh, impositions that telefilm, television makes upon a writer. Um, how was it for you when you were working on Sons of Liberty? Was your process the same? How conscious of you were that? Because it's obviously you're taking an insanely cinematic approach. Yeah. Well, it was, um, yeah, we shot, we built, um, we built, we built Boston and Bucharest. And, um, so it was, it was a challenging project for across the board. But, um, one of the things that I have learned over the years is that in a five act structure, in this case, they were nine act structures cause it's three nights and each night is a two hour movie, uh, that it changes. So you don't really pay attention, um, while you're shooting other than, you know, certain things, are kind of likely, I suppose, because you know what your 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 overall structure is. So you kind of you plan for, well, this could be a an act out, and so what would we do visually to help that? Um, you know, in in sort of procedurals, the the classic was the act out, you know, on the face, you know, and he and he gets the news. <laughs> So, so, and in this case, um, I knew it would move around, but I wasn't, I wasn't, um, you know, I, I was certainly paying attention to where I thought they were going to be. Now, you know, it, um, we had a lot of sort of big set epic -y things going on, and you know full well that in a 9X structure, um, you are going to get tripped up by, by some of that. So you do have to pay attention to, you know, the classic close-ups and, and, and all that sort of stuff as well. But... Um, I tried not to be too, um, you know, slave to the, the traditional, um, even though it was a bit more of a traditional um, execution in some ways. Okay. Um, so I want to move on to some some questions coming from a little bit of an angle, and then and then we'll come back. But one of the things, I said that this would be the last question of the panel, but I just can't resist. Um, <laughs> one of the things I, that I loved when, when Tiff... Uh, approached me about moderating this panel um, and and I, you know, cinematic television and I saw who was on it. I was like, yeah, tick, tick, tick. You want three Canadians who can talk about that? That's them. And then as I was working on it, I realized, oh my God, there's not a white guy. <laughs> and that never happens. And we know that there are just not enough women directing at all. There are not enough visible minorities directing at all. And given that the kind of television that we're talking about um, as cinematic, very often, if you look at the examples, it very often has an outsider's perspective. It very often is coming at things from an angle. And it's not playing into or profiting from the mainstream. In fact, it's the opposite of that. And I wonder if there is any glimmer of hope to think that this ascendant form of television will actually result in more diverse voices being amplified. What do you think? What do you think? Hard to say. 
um, you know, I've been in, I've worked in the advocacy for um, women directors, um, both here at the DGC and at the DGA, and um, I spent 15 years in the in the DGA working um, quite closely fostering, um, uh, you know, a world that was trying to, you know, promote female directors in the television world, for sure, and that was just a wall to climb. Um, so then we started focusing on features because features seem to have a, a better way in, um, I think across the board, um, because it wasn't quite so populated densely. I mean, as a female or as a visible minority, you could kind of tell your unique story and it, it, you could find investors and, you know, you could do it that way. Uh, that's now changing again. Um, so, uh, I'd like to say that it will change. I, I can't tell you though that it will, um. Because our history has has been that it has not changed. Now, having said that, I just did a high octane, you know, kind of, you know, really male driven. I mean, I, I, there was one small female role in the whole thing, and six guys, and you know, a lot of testosterone running around, um, and uh, battle sequences, and uh, guns, and I don't know, horses, and, you know, the whole deal. Um, and I'm a, uh, uh, you know, a woman from. Canada. So um, I got, I felt extremely lucky on the one hand that um, people felt my work was going to, you know, um, be, be, you know, service that, that production. Um, but I, I probably got lucky. Well, you did 50 Dead Men Walking, which is so proof of, I saw so much of that in, in the clip. Anyway, it was just proof of Well, true enough. And, and, you know, I came out of commercials where I was doing guy stuff, you know, cars and all that sort of stuff. So maybe it's just a personality thing. But I, but I do think that we are, have to carve ourselves out more and more. Well, I just want to, yeah, and I just want to, uh, what I think because of, uh, because there is a lot more content providers out there in different ways. The, there's the, uh, you know, of course, all the digital channels um, and uh, you know, just every day there seems to be some other thing coming up. I, I, I think that what there's an opportunity for, um, you know, for female directors in the sense of coming to, coming to us, to production companies like ourselves with material that they want to get involved with to, to write and direct. Um, the way I became a director is to create my own material in order to direct it. And that's just my route. You had a you know very different. I had the same. No, I had the same oh, cause, route. Because well, you know, I, I was invest in myself, a and it lot. was it, it was just I paid out for of my first film. It was out of necessity because it wasn't like done. A, a gal director, which wasn't you know. So I think that and and it, you know uh, and I've been on many of these. The statistics out there are crazy. There's like been studies by the women women media studies where the percentages of women directors are like at like, you know, 12%, 20%. 6% of Hollywood films. 6% of ho and feature films even worse. Uh, like 3% working, so it's... Yeah, yeah so... I was trying it, to tell my daughter not to go into this. You know, I know, I know, I know. So what, I, what I've been just trying to do is, again, you can't do it all, but I have we've been working with our company and we've got a, a team and just bringing in uh, young filmmakers who've done shorts, who've got really interesting ideas and I'm bringing in many senior people around them and hopefully they can develop their own series in which they will be able to not maybe do the pilot, but will be able to, you know, direct the, an hour down the road and and because and, they have no experience, right? So and I wouldn't give anybody whatever gender they are, uh, you know, they, you have to have some experience. So that, but that is a way um, that they can have their ownership. They have they they're in it right at the beginning. So there's something of amazing about being in a project right at the beginning because you can sit with it for such a for you got the, the luxury of time to develop your vision so when you're on set um for those who are not as experienced they've had that benefit of developing it and then can execute it so that's that's one thing i'm trying to do to to help more females get get in get into this um look i mean it, it's you know if you're a filmmaker it's it's hard period yes. across the board right um you know, if you're a white guy, I'm sure it's hard to, to get a, a, um, a film made. If you're uh, a black woman, it's probably a, a lot harder to get a film made, yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. But it's hard for everybody. Um, you know, it's hard for me. You know, I listen, I just did a, a six-part miniseries um, that, uh, is, that aired last night. So it's hard for me to complain that, I'm, you know, how hard it is for me. <laughs> you should feel sore for me as a black dude making... 
you know, but there's there's a personal and then there's the kind of industry, right? And personally, I you know, it's a you know, it's a very it's very very competitive, and you know, and I'm very competitive. I work, I try to work as hard as I can, and just try to figure out how do I how do I get my projects made, um, and so and so you know, if you're if you're uh, you know, a, a, in terms of the industry, the industry has to do a lot more work. Uh, you know, across the board, they have to do a lot more work with visual minorities. And the word diversity is kind of like, I have an issue with that word now. Because this is, this is probably the most controversial thing I'll say all day. I don't know if I want to say it. <laughs> say it? That I think diversity sometimes might be just, a, is now meaning white women. Right? That's now the, the word for diversity is now having that meaning. That's why those young women of color shouted it out. <laughs> I'm working with a native. Yeah. Uh, the woman I'm talking about is a native uh, filmmaker right. that I'm working with. Anyway. And, and so, and so it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, there's a personal, um, you, know, um, you know, I work hard and I try to get stuff done. But then there's, a, you know, um, from, the, from the industry and just from society in general, Society in, in general, I think, you know, there's a sense of scarcity now. You know, there's a sense of scarcity. And when there's a sense of scarcity, people, um, they, they circle the wag wagons and they sort of become much more insular and much more, you know, work with people they know, work with their friends, work with people they like. And, you know, there's less sense of um, letting anyone in because they're trying to protect what, what's theirs. It's right. so hard, and it's it's very scary to take risks. Yeah, because there's a lot of money involved. Exactly, and it's so so difficult just to get anything, anything off off the ground, ground. and yeah. executed in with the with diminishing budgets and all that kind of thing. I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, and so and so people become very conservative, um, and you know since 2008, it's become a lot more conservative. In the in the 90s, um, it was you know just from my sense, there was a lot more openness. There's a lot more you know. I mean, I I tell you how I got my start. It was 1991. The the uh, CFC had a program for filmmakers of color. In that program, we had Mina Shum, out of Vancouver, great filmmaker. We had myself. We had Stephen Williams, a fellow Black Canadian filmmaker who who's you know done Lost and a bunch of stuff in in, in L.A. And that program, you know, that time in the 90s, there was a sense of possibilities, a sense of more openness, just in terms of even black cinema, you know. Uh, but now I think it's, uh, there is, you know, this year has been interesting because this year I could think of three films done by black women, Selma, Belle, and um, the, the, the music film. Um, but, but, but anyway, you know, the, there's a, there's the industry, I think, has a lot more work to be done. But, you know, it's, it's a, we are in an industry that is very, you know, like it it's wants to take out anyone who is a very Darwinism. Yeah, yeah. It's a very Darwinism industry. And you got to figure out how to survive. It's, a, it's the survival of the fittest. You got to figure out a strategy of how you're going to survive and how you're going to get stuff done. And you have to rely on those gatekeepers, those gatekeepers to say, you know what? I'm a little scared, but maybe I'll let that black woman direct this episode. <laughs> Shout out. I, uh, I think also, you know, having worked a lot, I think, um, it, you know, we have to make it up to us too. I, I do think. Um, you have to take on the, the challenge, which, which is part of it, and you have to uh, constantly be value-adding your own skills. Because I think a lot of um, uh, middle-aged white guys would say they're having a hell of a hard time, too. Sure. So, you know, I, and, so what is it that they're doing to ratchet up their, um, you know, the, the why do I want to work with that person uh, sure. factor? And that's critical, and it's... it's it's uh, so it's up to us, I think, as much as it is up to the industry to to help us. Okay. Um, so I want to go back to, uh, and I know I need to um, toss it out to um, questions from the room, but I'm just going to ask one more question before I do. Just giving you all the old heads up, so you have time to think about your questions. Um, but I know <laughs> time flies when we're talking rather than listening, right? <laughs> I know. Um, anyway. <laughs> 
Um, uh, interesting thing about this whole question is that feature film has always been kind of referred to as long form. It's another way of discussing it. And yet when you look at um, serialized uh, television that is uh, appropriate, it's longer form, way longer form. Uh, binge watching can take you an entire weekend of your life gone. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you look at this, I'm, I'm kind of looking at like, what's the, what's the future of the feature film? Because when you look at what's happening theatrically, independent feature films are getting a much tougher time getting theatrical releases. Those theatrical releases are going to get more truncated as day and date strategies become more common for low budget independent cinema, which is mostly Canadian cinema answers to that description. Um, and then those films are going to go right on to the same SVOD services where all these shows are being binge binge watched. So in an environment like this, I mean, I used the word formats earlier, which I don't like because it's such an antiseptic term. It is slightly less antiseptic than the word content though. And on these uh, SVOD services, it's all content. And so within that, how do you feel feature films will be able to distinguish themselves, if at all? What's their unique offering? What's the future of the feature film is kind of the big question. Uh, well, I don't know. I have an opinion on this. I, you know, I, I think it's really super hard to make a feature these days. It's, it's hard to make anything. But, but and, um, you know, a, a friend of mine out of the States produced Dallas Buyers Club. And uh, that film took 10 years. Right? You know, and, and for example, so the, the, and, she has a list of seven others that didn't get made. So it's a, I'm not saying television is easier, but it just, I think it's open up. Anyway, the, the, I think features, um, as we know them, it's the one paradigm that is going to shift. It's shifting now. Television is shifting. It's all um, being corkscrewed into a new animal. The good news is that that new animal has a lot more windows for all of us and our work. And I think it's fair to say that um, your work might be distinguished by a half an hour, by an hour. What, what's a feature? A feature, as we know it, was determined by the ex exhibitors who needed to run certain numbers, you know, through a day. So they became, when I was a kid, we had intermissions and they were three hours. Then they became eventually 90 minutes sometimes 88 minutes, you know, which is pretty much a television show, and people were still paying a lot of money. So we've, we've kind of shifted everything around, and people, no one's looked at the experience of a feature for, versus the experience at home, and now we're getting this great entertainment at home where we can make our own popcorn. And, and you know, so there's a whole experiential change, and everyone kept relying on the, well, we like to be with other people. It's like, eh, not so much. You know, I want to be in my pajamas. and da -da. So that's even changing. So we can't say, yeah, I want to get packed into a little room and sit next to my elbows touching another guy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm not so sure, you know, that that's even working anymore. So the, the nostalgia of the theater is even changing. So I suspect we're going to find that it comes f full circle and we're going to have um, theaters being a subscription-based uh, medium where – whether it's a subscription to a, a theater chain or it's a subscription to a, a franchise, um, we're going to. I think theater or f this this paradigm is going to start to look to television and how it solves its its issues, and we're going to see television becoming you know over the top uh, OTTs and and various shelves where we're going to get our entertainment, and we're going to either purchase you know one offs. We're going to purchase. I mean, there's going to be no reason why. Various very high, you know high profile shows don't have their own sh you know shelf, so they're gonna if, if it's Walking Dead, you're gonna go to WalkingDead.com and all the 17 offsprings that it it spawns over the next while. So as all this shifts, um, I think a feature no longer has a definition because you could make a four hour piece that just runs four hours and people can decide where they click it and ch and stop or they can just let it run. Or it, you can make a 40-minute piece or a 10-minute piece. And we're starting to see that now on, on, on um, you know, digital. So I think it, it's a now just saying, wow, the lid just came off and it's fantastic. So it's all about financing and how do we just finance it to get to the eyeballs. And you guys? Well, I'm not 
not really in the feature film well, industries. Well, you know, I mean, I um, here's just, for me again. I never really, I, I don't think about the um, the the package. You know, I think about the story. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's where I I come at it. It's like, okay, I have a story to tell. What is the best form, and 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 how can I get it done within the system that is set up? You know what I mean. So so. Can I just ask yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. how? Because originally, I don't think we've touched on this, but Book of Negroes was originally going to be feature, right? Yes, I mean, so the, how did that? The 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 um yeah the uh, Book of Negroes was was going to be a feature, but the but the the financing system of the feature film market has changed. Over, My point uh, exactly. Right, right. Over the over the last um a couple, you know, no, a few years, and so you know, there's obviously a renaissance in um in the in the television now. But it's but for me it was always about the story, right? And 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 somehow trying to convince people that this is a great story to be told, right? I mean, cinema's always had its challenges in terms of, um, you know, when uh, when sound came in, everyone was panicking. It's over, you know what I mean? It's like it's never gonna happen. And then, and when you know, and then um, when when uh, a television came in in the forties and fifties, they're like, oh my god, it's dead. You know, it's it's over. And but you know, and then you had Godard put put the camera. You know, they invented these small little cameras, and Godard put it on his shoulder and started jump cutting it, and it invented itself again in the sixties, right? So I mean, I think I think cinema, in in terms of story, is pretty resilient. Mm-hmm. So and I think people are always about finding a great story. And then you know, if you could find that story on a Netflix, you know, that's where it's going to be. You know, but 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 if it's a crappy story, no one's going to download it. Can can I ask you something? Are you m- more? Do you care anymore then, whether it's on this screen or on CBC? Like, no, I'm no, I don't really listen. Um, it's it's always nice, and I, I, it's, there's nothing like the experience of going to a premiere of your movie, and it's packed house, and you know, and it's projected onto the screen. Um. But you know, I, 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 for me, I still think those days will still have that. I don't think the theater is going away. I think you know, I, I really believe that the theater will always be there. I agree, but the but the point is that no longer you don't, you're not as because I used to be. I'm sure you were too. Like I'd have two different pictures in my head of success, and one of them was what you just described. Okay, red carpet and the thing. I'm not as married to that anymore. I, I'm more married to to telling the story. Anywhere, any way it comes out. I, I, I still you like the red carpet. I, I still see myself walking up the stairs of the of can, uh, waving oh at everybody. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. That'd be I good. Still, I still, the French, the, the French are still holding it down. And then when, when when the French like say, you know what, it's over, then it's over. Yeah. All right. All right. C'est fin. C'est fini. Whatever. It's not for you. It's not for you. Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, are there questions? Yes. Uh, we were talking film and, and, and television, but commercials. Oh, yeah. Um, do do you cringe when sometimes they have to cut short the sequence? Like there's a moment that you wanted to play out reactions or to linger on a little bit longer, but then they cut it because you need to go to either commercials or you have to finish it in an hour. Yes, I do cringe, and and, and there have been. There have been times where, um, you know, I just I just want a scene like to play in a, like a long and a beautiful long shot because I think I got more information in terms of the dynamics of the character and the story without the edit, you know, without the cut to the close up, you know. Uh, and but I've had network executives say, "Hey, that's just too long a dolly pull, you know. We we've got to get things moving." So. Again, it's about how we, you know, how do we watch information? How do we, are we changing our viewing habits? That like that was for network television, where I don't think you'd ever get that comment if it was a, you know, a a non-commercial oriented, like a premium cable kind of scenario. So those things are very much a problem when you're dealing with network executives and and, and your shows. And if you if you look at the idea of behavior telling the story, I noticed that Adrian was cringing even as she was listening to your question. <laughs> I was like, I, just, mm. I had a flashback to the, that exact <laughs> moment, and, I, and that it's still painful today. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yes, Sujith.
topic because, oh, sorry. I, I, I found what you were saying really interesting, but it was a little confused by the title, the cinematic television boom, because it seems to me that what we're talking about is, well, we have different formats now. We have the eight pack and we have, you know, these long form series like Game of Thrones or we have network television or all that stuff. But surely all of them can be cinematic. Right? I think that's the point. But, but, uh, and you bring your cinema to the table, but now more than ever, you're expected, you know, back to the hard hat conversation, there was a time, and I literally had it happen to me, where it was meant as a derogatory comment that my work was looking too cinematic. And I didn't know how to take the comment. Uh, you know, cut to four years later, four or five years later, that has been what's carved me out of the pack. So there was a time when, when television said no, it was always cut to the close-up, they didn't care about the sets, they didn't re really, you know, it was all about the dialogue, and that has shifted, and really in the last 24 months, even more so, it's really shifted to be um, m so much more, it wants to look like a feature. Bring your feature sensibility to it. Are you finding that more, in the, well, I don't even know how much you work here in Canada, but do you, are you finding that more in the, the U.S. versus here? Yeah, I haven't worked here for a while, but um, uh, the very much in the U.S. Yeah. On, here, much we're a little yeah. bit lagging behind. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's it's interesting the word um, cinematic because for me, as a filmmaker, you know, I, I like I like things to be specific. You know, I'd like to know that Michael Bay did that movie. You know, when you see a Michael Bay movie, nobody else could have done that movie, right? Or if you see you know, a Tarantino movie, nobody else could have, you know, done that movie. And so for me, I don't, if it's generic, if, if, any, if any Tom, Dick, or Harry could have done that show or done that scene, it's not interesting to me. I want to know, I want to see a voice, I want to see a point of view, I want to see an approach, I want to get something specific as opposed to, you know, um, a very generic uh, show, but but don't you think that's then the the boom that we're starting to see, and maybe that's a bit of the definition of cinematic is that, you know, like you did all six, and you'll probably do six of your next one or whatever, and hopefully I'll do a bunch of mine. That we're we're bringing our voice to a show now. Right. That's six just six hours versus two hours. That's right. that's all the difference. Well, I think what's happening now is there's way more of an appetite for the six to one to, to eight hour episode, the short term series, the novelizations in which uh, one director can bring their entire vision to it, and that lends to, lends itself to something a little bit more cinematic um, than what we've been seeing in the past. Because in the past, broadcasters have not been interested in six one hours or eight one hours, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I know just adding, you know, when we were at, at Super Channel or at Alliance Atlantis, looking at a first-time feature filmmaker, because there you're taking a really big risk, the question was always, could anyone other than this person make that movie? Right. And if their voice wasn't that unique, there was no point taking the risk. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering about audiences. Um, because uh, ve very often, or you know, in the conversation, which is fascinating, so thank you so much. And it's indeed very nice to see women and people of color um, in this country, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> in this country, which uh, should definitely proud itself in having talent from this kind of uh, groups. So, um, so yes, audiences, because I, I find a lot of conversations are very often from the creator's point of view or from the either gatekeepers or executives, but I'm wondering what is the conversation you are having about audiences, either with your producers or with your or with your, the, the TV channels? Well, I just had a recent conversation about uh, um, that with a broadcaster who, uh, it, they are very much opening up to um, more cable sensibilities. They're willing to take more chances in terms of the stories not always the stories being more character driven here that's the new thing character like cbc for example only two years ago it was we want another flashpoint we want episodics right so with that regime going we have a new regime that's all about we want 
very, very premium cable, character-driven series with, with uh, you know, non, you know, please explore nonlinear structures. We know where we want to create uh, our signature stamp that way. We want a tour-driven series. So those are the kind. You know, that's with CBC, CTVs. I, I can't speak for them. I haven't been dealing with them, but I know that with uh, pitching to Shaw. They're open. They're, they're probably not going as extreme as CBC, but they're they've said how well like the broad churches of the world did. So those are very. There's still a mystery element. They still have the the crime series, which is a bit more mainstay. But at the same time, they have those really interesting characters, very very strong character arcs. So it's not just about the case. It's about the character. So those are some of the changes that I'm seeing. Uh, we had a lot of conversations about audience. In fact, it was pervasive, for example, in, in um, Sons. But uh, in general, I, uh, there's a lot of... Con and everybody seems to be an expert. So I'm not sure that anyone is. Um, but I can tell you there's tremendous um, uh, focus on how to get eyeballs right now because audiences are being fractured and we've got so many different places to go. So what is also really good is um, I think we're going to see more and more um, uh, success stories that wouldn't play in a sort of a, a broad spread, but will find their niche audiences um, and be very successful. Girls is a great example of that, and, and a bunch of others. Um, you know, I mean, of course, the, the legendary Breaking Bad, which didn't really have an audience of, of any note until people could find it. So now Orange people can... Right. Orange is the New Black, same thing. So once people can find this stuff... You can you can rock and roll. Um, you know, I mean, for me, in, in terms of audience, I was a bit nervous about the Book of Negroes and going on on uh, CBC. Would people watch it? It's you know, it's a, you know, it, the book did sell, but I just found out that 1.68 million people watched the Book of Negroes last night. Overnights only. <laughs> that's amazing. That's like that's 1.8. That's that's 1.6. Eight and, and overnight, and hopefully with the PVR, as it could push it up up to two mil. Yeah, hopefully. Um, but you know, I mean, listen, I was nervous because audiences have been. People are told, telling me, look, you know, Clement, if you get six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand, be happy because that's that's a new reality. You know, um, but uh, you know, you know that roots like the, the new reality. Uh, is really interesting. Roots or, or um, some of the big NBC series of, of the 80s, they did like 80 million people. Because there was only three channels, but there was only three channels you could go to, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the difference. That's how much it's... And then they pulled, they pulled Shogun, I think it was, because it did 24 million people. They pulled it off the air. I mean, we would be begging for that today. Anything would be, right? So it's a very different world than it was 25 years ago when there were three or four channels. Okay, well, I've been given the signal to wrap it up. So uh, I just want to thank the panelists. Thanks so much. That was absolutely great. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Thank you very much.